The scripture reading this morning will be from Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Good morning, brethren and friends. We're happy to see you here on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. We're thankful that uh, you could be here, and uh, we know we have many more uh, joining us and worshiping from uh, a, a different location, but uh, with uh, still taking precautions with COVID, and we welcome you as well. We're grateful to all of our men who have led us in worship up to this point, and uh, thankful that we have the opportunity to worship our Heavenly Father together today. A reminder of our weekly challenges, um, we'll add a new one next week. So uh, we have six up to this point. I'll not do a rundown again. I've been doing that each week, but uh, there they are, the first uh, three, and then uh, the next three as well. Uh, as a reminder, if you've not started doing these yet, please do so. Join in with any one of them. Uh, it'll help when all the congregation is working together. And uh, many are doing them, doing them weekly and continuing to do them. Thank you so much for that. Uh, continue to do them this week. And as I said, next week, we will add a, a new a weekly challenge. Uh, so we're excited about uh, that and all that we're able to do with it. I'm not really sure what is going on with my voice today. I woke up this morning and it's scratchy at best. So I'm going to do what I can to preserve it throughout the sermon uh, our scripture reading from Luke chapter 23 is where we will begin this morning as we consider three crosses. We consider three crosses. You know, crucifixion was a, 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 a common uh, form of death during the time that Jesus lived, a common form of uh, putting people to death. It's uh, uh, something that would happen often. It's continuing to happen uh, many, many years even after our Lord's crucifixion. Uh, but we think back to it, especially because uh, that was what everything was pointing to, our Lord giving himself as a sacrifice. And on that particular day, as you know, and as Lane just read for us in Luke chapter 23, there were two criminals crucified with him, one on either side. So, of course, oftentimes today you'll see on the highway and other places people will, will put three crosses as a reminder. They're looking back to this uh, central event and the lives of Christians and the theme of Christianity when Jesus sacrificed his blood for us as Josh so ably led us and reminded us this morning while partaking of the Lord's Supper. But I want us to take a look at those crosses when you uh, consider uh, these three crosses. The first cross, the cross of the Savior. The cross of the Savior. He died because of sin. This cross of Jesus, it represents the cross that died because of sin. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5, we are reminded something that if you're, if you're ever dealing with pride, uh, if you ever need to allow the Word of God to humble you, if you're ever forgetful on what you mean to God or really how, how, how little we are and what God did for us, read Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 through 11, when you consider the cross of the Savior, the cross that the one that died on it was because of sin. Beginning in verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. If we're not careful, we as children of God will, will, will begin to think that we've earned something or that God owed us something. Or that God owes us something. If, if we're not careful, we can get into that mindset. Because we're constantly battling everyone. We're battling that of other world religions. We're battling that of false forms of Christianity. We're battling that of worldly people who do not believe in God or any God. So we're constantly battling all of this. And we go back to the scriptures to make sure we're doing things according to the Bible. But if we're not careful, 
we'll sometimes maybe place ourselves on the level of God. We're God's children. He loves us. We're part of his family. But go back and read verse 6 again. When Christ died, he died for the ungodly. That's all of us. That's all of us. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because we know it to be 100%. With everyone here who is of an accountable age, we've all sinned. We have all transgressed against God, First John chapter 5 and verse 17. We, 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 we're, we're all in this number. We're all in this group. And Christ died for the sinners. That cross that the Savior died on, the cross, the one who died was because of sin. Because of the sins of the people that nailed him on the cross. Because of the sins of the people in days gone by. But for the future sins as well. For those of us living in this year 2021 and those who shall live. That blood was shed on that day for all of the sins of the world. When you think about the power of the blood, when you think about the power of the blood, you think about the remembrance of it as we've already observed this morning in the Lord's Supper. And you think about, and you go back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Christ died for sinners. In verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Without that cross, without his willingness to go to it, we would be forever lost. There is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to, to pay the way of your salvation. God did his part, and that part includes that of we doing our part. We must obey God. We must respond in obedience for what God has done for us. Verse 10 is really where it comes together for me. For if when we were enemies, have you ever thought about being an enemy to God? Have you ever thought? We don't really think about it. We're children of God. We're servants of God. We're followers of God. We're saved. But when we're in sin, we're against God. When we're in sin, we're against God. When we're in sin, we're enemies. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. There was a time when we were enemies, and then you put on Christ in baptism, and you become a child of God. And as long as you continue to live faithful, the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse you, as we looked last week in 1 John chapter 1. And, and, and we realized that it's while we were these enemies of God, while we were in our sins, that Christ died for us. That first cross, that middle cross, having a thief on either side of him would represent the cross of the Savior. The, the, the cross, the, the, that, that cross would represent the one that died because of sin, because of my sins. And because of your sins. I, I've given this challenge before to the congregation here. Not part of our weekly challenges. But I've said if, you've, if you're struggling with your Christianity. And maybe you're thinking about giving up. Or asking why do I do this. Go back and read the account of the crucifixion. In any of the gospels. Or in all of the gospels. Go somewhere where you're all alone. And you have a mirror. And you, you read what he did. And then you look up into that mirror. And you say for me he died. For me, he was scourged. For my sins, he went to the cross. For my sins. That's a reminder of what Christ did for us. Look to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1. In Matthew chapter 4, as you know, Matthew chapter 3 ends with Jesus uh, getting baptized by John the baptizer. And then Matthew chapter 4 begins with our Lord and his temptation in verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted the same as we are. He, he, he's tempted just the same. Uh, he, he, there there might, be different, might be packaged differently. It, the, the, the way that the temptation reached him might be packaged differently, and it might be packaged differently from one generation to the next, but temptation is always the same. Sin is always the same. And, and we find that Jesus in these what points were tempted, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, as you continue to read the first 11 verses, you, you're reminded that three different times the devil tempted Jesus. And the devil used scripture, of course, that's a different lesson for a different day, but he used scripture. He used scripture, he just misapplied it, he tried to change it, he tried to twist it. 
Jesus also used scripture. Jesus all three times said it is written. Jesus used the same line of defense that you and I have. That's the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 18, putting on the armor of God, that includes the Bible, of course. Jesus used the exact same line of defense that you and I have. If he would have used anything outside of our ability, perhaps, perhaps we would have an argument on Judgment Day. But we don't. He used exactly what we have, the Word of God, to battle the devil. I bring that up to say this. If Jesus would have sinned on that day or any other time, he could have went to the cross. Have you thought about that? 33 years without ever sinning. How easy is it to sin? How, it's easier, of course, when we're, when we're not close to God, but how easy is it to sin? How easy is it just to have a sinful thought? Jesus never had one. And he was able to go to that cross as the pure sacrifice, giving himself for our sins. The Hebrews writer would remind us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He understands that temptation. And when you're dealing, right now this morning, it, it may not be a struggle for you. Temptation might not be. You're surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. You're, 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 we're studying the Bible. We're singing. We're praying. It, it may be that, that temptation isn't that strong. Some, perhaps it is. Perhaps the temptation to not worship. Perhaps the temptation to sit here but not worship is something that you deal with. Whatever the temptation it might be, whether it's during worship services or, or, or when, when you're away, we must be reminded that Christ went through this. Was in all points tempted, yet without sin. He never sinned. What, 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 a, what a comforting thought it is to know that he never sinned. And that's why he was able to give himself for our, as a sacrifice for our sins. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18 for in that Jesus himself has suffered, being tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. Brethren and friends, during your time of temptation, when the devil and his angels are throwing their best at you, when the evil people of this world are really trying to get to you, have you recalled Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18? He is able to aid those who are tempted. He is able to aid you when you are tempted. He is able to help you when you are tempted. He is able to see you through and get you to the other side when you are tempted because he knows what it's like. He has been there and he has done that. In the book of Matthew chapter 1, as you remember our Lord, uh, is the genealogy account as Matthew, a Jew, giving it to Jews, would say in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, she will bring forth a son, speaking of Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Imagine if you were born to give yourself as a sacrifice. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, that great prophecy, the virgin will bear a son. Imagine if you were born to give yourself as a sacrifice. We know we're, none of us are going to live forever. We're all going to die. So we could say, you know, if you were born to die, but, but we, are, we are, we will. But imagine if you were born to give yourself as a sacrifice for the sins of other people. Imagine if you sent your son to give himself as a sacrifice for the sins of other people. Isn't it amazing how parenthood will change you in our text of Matthew 1 and our other text of Romans chapter 6 or Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 11, you know, I thought many times, sure, there's, there's people I think I would die for. I don't want to die. I want to give my, I'd like to live a long, full life. But I think there's people I'd probably die for. And then I had a son. And I understand a little more. I'm not ready to give him for your life. I'm sorry, that might sound hurtful or hateful, but I'm just speaking the truth. The Father gave His Son for your life, for my life. Think about that. He was born to give Himself as a sacrifice. That first cross, that middle cross, the one that Jesus died on, the one that the Savior died on, 
died because of sin. But you go back to our text in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. We know that there are crosses on either side, two criminals, one on each side. One cross would represent the saved. The saved died to sin. Open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. One of the crosses, one of the criminals. You know, in Matthew's account, Matthew says that both criminals blasphemed. So I don't know exactly all that's going on there. Perhaps it is. You know, Jesus was on that cross six hours. Maybe in the beginning, both criminals were against Jesus. Both were blaspheming. I don't know. But yet through that period of time, maybe that one criminal who would say, Lord, remember me. Maybe, maybe during that period of time, maybe he begins realizing he really is the Christ. He really is the Messiah. I don't know. There was a period of time that they were on the cross. Maybe when, you know, all others are, you know, these criminals are wanting to be saved. And, you know, and you can read history about some of the things they would do and say on the cross. But here Jesus is only speaking words of love. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When we behold thy son. You think of all of the loving words that Jesus was saying. I, I don't know the process of time that caused Matthew to say both criminals blaspheme. But caused Luke to say Jesus saved one of them. I, I don't know all of that. But I do know in Luke's account we see that one of them thankfully recognized his fault. One of them recognized his sin and he would say, you know, we're here because we deserve to be here. But this man, he's, he's not done anything wrong. So for this one criminal, he died to sin, representing the saved. Matthew, or Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Here the writer is writing to those who have already been saved from their sins. In the next two verses, he reminds them how they were saved. In doing so, we can learn what we must do to be saved. But what he's using verses 3 and 4 for is to remind them this is how you were saved. But the key of the text, the point of the text, goes back to verse 2. Look, because you're saved, you've died to sin. Don't live in sin. Don't live that life. And, of course, there's a difference in a mistake in living in sin. But we should do what we can to try to limit. If you're trying your best to, to, to eliminate mistakes, then you're likely not going to live in sin. If I'm trying everything I can to, to eliminate even the smallest mistakes. But that's, that's what the writer is saying in Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. Look, you, you've been, you, you cannot live in sin. You should not live in sin. You've died to sin. Don't, do not live any longer in it. Dropping down to verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. The old man, the old way. That's what, in the book of, books of Ephesians and Colossians, it talks about crucifying the old man, putting off the old man, and putting on the new man. Here he's talking about it. Our old man, that sinful man, that sinful way was crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. When you repent of your sins... You've, you've died to those sins. You're saying, I'm stopping those sins. You're, you're giving them the death sentence. You are putting it to death. In whatever way you can and whatever you need to do, you're stopping the sin. You know Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 well, perhaps because of the song. When we take this verse and, and, and put it to tune, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the apostle Paul would say, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I have crucified that old man, that old life that stoned Stephen to death in Acts chapter 7. That old life that took men and women and put them into prison. Those old ways. Paul saying, I have crucified that life. That's what you do when you become a Christian. You put to death that former life. You put to death sin. You crucify that life to live in it no longer. That cross of the criminal who recognized his sins represents the cross of the saved. The one who died to sin. In the book of Galatians chapter 5 in verse 24, Paul says, Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Brethren and friends, let me ask you, have you crucified yourself lately? Have you crucified yourself lately? Have you crucified your sins lately? Have you crucified your desires lately? Have you crucified your passions lately? Have you crucified your lust lately? Have you crucified your temptations lately? It's the language of the Bible. And that's what it takes if we want to get 
out of the world and come closer to God. In the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, as the verse ends, not knowing that the, godly, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. We must be ready and willing to repent. We must be ready and willing to give up. Peter's next sermon in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, maybe it's not as popular as we study it uh, in the book of Acts as that of Acts chapter 2. Maybe we do not use it as much. We should. But in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, he says, Repent therefore and be converted the cross of the saved. He died to sin. I truly believe that the, 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 the repenting process of one coming out of the world and into Christianity is that death sentence to sin, that crucifixion to sin, and then the baptism is what washes it away. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 59, if you, if you will, if you, would, if you would, whatever you need to do, circle it, highlight it, write it down, remember this verse. This is a great description of what repentance is. In Psalm chapter 119 and verse 59, I thought about my ways and I turned my feet to your testimonies. It, it, it takes a thought process. It's, it's not just an emotional charge. It's not just uh, you know, something bad has happened and, hey, I need to find another way or, or, or everybody else is doing this. It's not sometimes that sparks us and there's nothing wrong with that, but it is a thought process. Again, Psalm 119 and verse 59, I thought thought about my ways I, I stopped and I thought about this what am I doing why am I doing this and, and, and using the word of God I come to the conclusion that it's wrong so what do I do I turn away from them I turn away from them that's what repentance is we think about our ways we compare them to the Bible and anything that is not in line with the word of God we turn away from them we crucify them. But then you go back to Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. That third cross, sadly it represents the cross of the lost. And he died in sin. The, 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 the cross of the Savior died because of sin. The cross of the saved died to sin. But the cross of the lost, he died in sin. And that's not what we want. That's not what you want. That's not what I want. Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. I suppose with the attitude that we read of this man in Luke chapter 23 and verse 39. Had Jesus saved him, which he had all power to do so. Had Jesus had taken him off of that cross. I suppose he would have been like those nine of the ten lepers. And he probably would have went on his way never even considering Again, what Jesus did for him. I don't know. That's just kind of the conclusion I draw. Because he, although he was drawing his final breaths, could not see the importance of submitting himself to God. This one would represent the cross of the lost, the one who died in sin. In John chapter 8, in verse 24, John chapter 8 and verse 24. You remember what Jesus would say in John chapter 8 and verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Before you can ever repent of your sins, you must know why you're doing it. And you must believe in Jesus as the Christ, as the Savior. You, you, you must understand this before ever being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Believing that Jesus is the Christ. Believing that his, his, He is the Savior. Believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. We remember that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. But we also are reminded in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. And that's in, that eternal separation from God. Death, of course, sometimes speaking of our physical death, and, and, and for this one, it was leading to his physical death. Have you ever thought about that? Their deeds, these criminals, both led to their physical death. But for one of them, he did not have to suffer the eternal death because he chose to give himself to God and be saved according to God's plan. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27. When the thought comes up and the discussion of sin and we say you know all sin is sin and it's all transgression against God it's all against God Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27 is a verse that must be remembered 
Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, but there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an, an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing that defiles, not anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. The question is sometimes asked about that, the, 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 the unpardonable sin, the, the sin that cannot be forgiven. Is there really a sin that cannot be forgiven? Absolutely there is. It's the one that you do not repent of. One you do not repent of. It's, it's, it's the one that, 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 that you continue to live with. That's, that's the unforgiven sin. It's the one that, that it, it doesn't matter if it's a lie or murder. It doesn't matter if it's you know, cheating on a term paper or stealing million, millions. It doesn't matter. It's the one that you will not repent of. So as we draw our lesson to a conclusion... Think with me of these three crosses. The Savior, you cannot die in that way. You can, you can take that cross out right now. You cannot die as the Savior. So that, that, that death is gone. But you will die in one of the other two ways. Maybe not on a cross. But either as a saved or as the lost. There are no other options. One of those two ways. The decisions that you're making now, oh, how important are they? We do not know when life shall end. We must be prepared every day. Yesterday I had the honor of preaching a funeral for a dear friend of mine, the lady who introduced me to mission work some years ago. And although she died just in the past few days, her, her salvation was locked in about five or six years ago. And that's when she was no longer able to use their mental abilities. Thankfully, in comparison of her life to the Bible, she was ready and prepared. But you see, it might be that I live many more years. It might be that I don't. It might be that I physically live but mentally do not live. That's why we urge you. We pray for you. We petition you to, 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 to not put off salvation. Not put off salvation. Because we never know what shall be on the day. Or throughout tomorrow. If there's anything that we can do to help you to get from lost to saved. We'll study with you. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll welcome you back as a child of God if you're not faithful. We'll baptize you if you're ready to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Whatever your needs are, we want to help you to get your life in accordance to the Bible so you can go to heaven. If we can help you at this time, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing.